Loading at Bluff, New Zealand's most southerly port, is SS Wairua. Going aboard are stores for one of the world's unusual expeditions. Every year, boats go to small outlying islands to catch the young of the sooty shearwater, a seabird known throughout New Zealand as the mutton bird. Once a staple food of the old-time Maoris, they're now a national delicacy, eagerly sought after by thousands of New Zealand connoisseurs. On board are the birding families and their relations, 150 people in all. Theirs is the hereditary right, descended from their Maori ancestors, of making the annual visit to the islands to reap the rich mutton bird harvest. The ship ploughs towards the icy south. There is no land between here and the ice of the South Pole. Nothing to break the force of the enormous rollers, except the treacherous shores of these islands. Nobody lives on the remote mutton bird islands, so the birders have to make themselves self-sufficient for their eight-week stay. With them comes food, timber and iron for repairing their huts, and salt for salting down the birds. For the exclusive privilege of catching the mutton birds, these people suffer plenty of hardships. Yet so highly did the old-time Maoris value the titi, as they called them, that they made the hundred-mile voyage across these wild seas in their narrow open canoes. Not all the birders land at one spot, but parties are put ashore at various points around the island. Mutton birds nest in burrows and have to be dug out. And here's the prize, the fat downy chick of what is properly called the sooty shearwater. Reared on a diet of fish, they're fat and oily, with a very distinctive flavour. The shearwaters migrate from the northern hemisphere to breed on these small islands in the southern seas, and the birding expeditions are timed to catch the birds before they fly north again. Each afternoon, the birds are dressed and rubbed in salt which, with their own fat, helps to preserve the catch. They're still packed in the traditional Maori way. To hold them, bags are made from kelp, the giant seaweed found in these parts. These are put in flax kits, with a layer of totara bark on top to protect them. When the Wairua is due back from the mainland, the camps are tidied up and the 80-pound bags of mutton birds sent down to the shore by wire rope and chute. The birders will be rewarded for the hardships of their exclusive occupation when they reach the mainland where the buyers are waiting. From this and other expeditions, 300,000 birds have been taken this season, yet there will probably not be enough to meet the demand for this popular New Zealand delicacy. Next year the birders will be back, but now they're looking forward to seeing Bluff Harbour again. The lonely Titi Islands have been left behind. New Zealand, they're staging American-style rodeos nowadays. Wild West movies have probably had their influence, but contests in riding the buck jumper have long been popular on New Zealand sheep and cattle stations. Two boys on a bull is handicapping the bull. But he'll shortly lower his handicaps. The girls are as game as the boys and bite the dust with the greatest of ease. This Maori girl was so mad at getting what Yanks call a bum steer that she wants to try again. And this girl is steering for a fall. Tee off the mantelpiece tonight. They call this pie.
passing the buck. He's rid of his rider, so what's he kicking about? This is something revolutionary in riding. He's getting wound up for a good ending. In Poinders Road, near Clapham Common, South London, was the home of Mrs. and the late Mr. W. Oldman. Thanks to good fire watching by Mr. and Mrs. Oldman, their house came through the Blitz without much damage, and their vigilance has meant a lot to all people interested in the ancient history of the Pacific for their house held one of the best private collections of Polynesian art in the world. The Polynesians were the remarkable brown-skinned people who spread through the Pacific Islands, to Hawaii in the north and New Zealand in the south. These were pagan gods, worshipped by the Rarotongan people of the mid-Pacific. This is an ancient Hawaiian drum, coveted by many museums. To look at Mr. Oldman's collection came Dr. Roger Duff, director of one of the New Zealand museums, and eminent authority on the art of the New Zealand Maoris. Mr. Oldman had many rare treasures to show him. This is a Maori bird perch with hollowed feeding bowl. And here a sacred feeding funnel, used in olden days by a Maori chief, when under the spell of tapu, this one is considered by authorities to be the finest in existence. The collection of carved feather boxes are also specimens of unsurpassed quality. In them, the chief kept the precious feathers of the rare huia bird, feathers worn only on ceremonial occasions. The fine mounted greenstone adze is another of the many treasures. The ancient Maoris were Stone Age men, and the astonishingly hard greenstone, a form of jade, was widely used for weapons, tools and ornaments. Mr. Oldman's trays of greenstone tickies were unbelievable in their number and variety. Worn as pendants by Maori women, and sometimes by chiefs, these are all genuine Stone Age work, carved without the aid of metal tools. Mr. Oldman was a retired art dealer turned collector, and over the years had acquired his collection from all parts of the British Isles. In another tray were Maori flutes, rare relics today. The double flute on the left is especially notable. Shortly before Mr. Oldman died, the New Zealand government bought his unique collection. So these wonderful specimens of Polynesian art, which had been assembled with so much devotion, were returned to their homeland. Once more, the intricate spirals of the canoe prows crossed the waters of Moana Nui Kiwa, crossed the great sea of Kiwa. They came from the house in Poinders Road, Clapham, London, to museums in faraway New Zealand. The Polynesian artifacts from the Oldman collection are now among the museum's most treasured possessions. For all New Zealand students of Maori art, the field of investigation has been immeasurably widened. Today, student teachers are seeing the carvings that have not been in their country for nearly a hundred years. One of the greenstone tickies is taken from its case so that the students can examine the workmanship of the old-time Maoris. A precious museum piece now, it will no longer be worn as a pendant, but will be here to be admired and studied for all time. <laughs>